All right, and uh, now we're going to cap off our uh, final leg here today of the uh, introductory uh, videos for the uh, 2025 Oscars at a Glance series. And we are going to go ahead and lay down a little bit of uh, some early predictions for you. Um, so obviously at this stage, uh, we're, geez, what are we, four, basically four and a half months away from Oscar nominations being announced, and another six weeks, or six weeks, excuse me, six months plus away from the actual ceremony. So, um, obviously a lot happens through an Oscar season. We see films get pulled, we see films come in and crash and burn, we see movies that, uh, exceed expectations, and the Oscars is always a wild ride as far as who's going to win, who can win, etc., etc. So, uh, I'm going to go ahead and we'll uh, start with the Best Picture category. Again, it's a solid 10 uh, films, so we'll go ahead and get started here. And at this early stage in the game, just looking at the films and everything, my first pick for who will win Best Picture here in 2025 is Blitz. Blitz is going to be my opening film to uh, predict here. Uh, again, the Steve McQueen IOU factor is huge, um, particularly if, if this film has any kind of technical uh, well-being about it, where it's it's looked at as a really respected film, technically speaking, even if the uh, script maybe isn't the best, even if the script is not going to win its uh, a screenplay prize, an original screenplay, even if it doesn't get any acting wins. If the movie's looked at as a technical, doesn't and again, doesn't have to be even a technical marvel, as long as it's t looked at technically as a well-made film, you can argue that Steve McQueen, with the IOU factor not winning Best Director for 12 Years a Slave, uh, it might be enough to push this film over the edge into winning Best Picture. Um, my big thing right now, too, is I do feel like it's going to get a good little spread of above-the-line categories and below-the-line categories. Uh, very much has a good chance at getting eight, nine, ten nominations in that range. Maybe even a couple more, depending, you know, maybe we don't know yet. Maybe it has an original song in there. Otherwise, you're looking at, like, film editing as a possibility. You're looking at uh, makeup, maybe, as a possibility. Uh, the two design categories, cinematography, score, um, screenplay, at least an acting prize or two, director picture. That's 11 right there. Um, and um, I think I've... I think that's everything. Um, <laughs> just off the top of my head of, of, you know, possible places for it to land and everything. But, uh, yeah. So that's my first place pick is uh, is Blitz. In second place, I actually have Honora. Uh, again, this is your Palm Door winner. Uh, Sean Baker, again, is absolutely, I think, on the rise with the Academy. Uh, he's a, a name that they know. They might not extensively know his filmography. But I think he's on the rise. This is going to be one of the critical darlings of the year. I can easily see it walking away with tons of those regional prizes, uh, be it the uh, New York Film Critics Circle, LA Film Critics Awards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it can win a lot of those. It can, you know, definitely be one of the more um, highbrow films in that way. Do I think it's going to lead nominations? Absolutely not. I mean, we're, again, we're looking at maybe one or two tech categories, and the rest of its uh, breadth of uh, welcome is going to be in those above-the-line categories. So that's uh, one of the reasons maybe right now I'm saying that. Um, we haven't seen a Palm Door winner win Best Picture, of course, since Parasite. Um, which, you know, again, you know, Parasite was, you know, a big international factor there. I think Enora, too, just with its storyline and some of its characters and stuff, this could be, again, a film that I think the BAFTAs might, it might do a little better at BAFTA than we initially think. Um, I think, again, it's got a good shot at uh, getting at least one or two acting uh, nominations, one in particular, of course, with Best Actress. Um, and again, I think Best Director is definitely in play here as well. Uh, in third place, third place, I have Conclave, uh, Edward Berger's film. Again, this is one that could get a little sprinkling, a good little sprinkling of a mix between technical nominations and um, above-the-line prizes. Particularly, it can get two or maybe three acting races. Uh, could break into director and picture. That's five right away. S uh, screenplay would be six. And from there, you know, look at maybe one or two or possibly three uh, tech categories. So this could be, again, probably not the most nominated film come Oscars morning, but it's definitely going to be in the mix there and I think has a chance to win maybe one or two categories. In fourth place is Amelia Perez. And I did actually look it up uh, not long after the last video there. Uh, supposedly Netflix has slated this for November 1st for limited release, and it'll go on Netflix later in November, probably the second or third weekend, somewhere in there. Um, and I think with Amelia Perez, we're looking at it, again, 
really getting uh, most of the nominations for this one in above the line categories. Um, Potentially, we're looking at three, maybe even, I don't know if it has possibility of landing four, but three acting nominations is certainly a possibility. Um, It could really uh, do some damage there in the screenplay and directing categories, um, possibly a film editing nomination. So um, otherwise, below the line, I haven't heard a lot for like where this one could strike. But uh, again, as far as I know, it's not a period piece or anything that, you know, Maybe doesn't necessarily help it in some of those tech, uh, some of those design categories. But still, uh, in fourth place, I think you can do a lot worse than Amelia Perez. In fifth place, I'm going to go with Joker, Folia Adieu. Uh, again, it's not common we see sequels win Best Picture. The original Joker ended up getting the most nominations in 2019, and it got, uh, what was it, two or three wins? Um, I'm trying to remember here. I think it was just the two, right? Joaquin and the score? Um, unless there's a third win that I'm just totally forgetting about right now. But... Um, I think with Joker, again, uh, this one I think you're going to see a decent amount of its nominations come on the technical side, and it'll still land a couple of above-the-line categories. I don't think it'll quite do as well as the first Joker, because that landed screenplay, director, actor, and picture. Uh, This one I think will come close to that. Um, Again, I'm not sure about its chances in screenplay. I'm not 100% sure about its chances in director at this point, but... um, I think otherwise, a lot of the tech categories and stuff, I think it's going to be solid in. So um, that, and then obviously, as long as it's not a huge critical bomb, which I don't think it will be, the uh, trailers have been really, really good and everything. Um, I expect, again, uh, some of that um, uh, well-being from the first film to carry over here into the second one. Speaking of sequels, in sixth place, I do have Dune Part 2. Um, again, I have made it a point to try to rewatch this movie. I will try to rewatch it here in the next, uh, hopefully sometime. Um, like I said, I'm going to be out of the country here after a little while. So maybe I'll watch it on a, on a plane ride on the way over or something to one of these countries. But anyhow, um, that being said, um, Dune Part 2, again, this is the one I would say uh, has the highest shot at landing most nominations. Again, most of those, if not a majority of those, are going to come below the line. Otherwise, we're looking at picture, director, screenplay, and then pretty much any other tech category. It's got a really good shot at getting nominated, again, outside of maybe original song. Um, but, like, the score probably will get nominated. The uh, makeup will get nominated. The costume and production design will both get nominated. Uh, cinematography will get nominated. That's eight. Um Let's see here. Um, the sound category, it'll get into the sound category. Visual effects, it'll get into. That's 10. Um, and I still, again, I feel like I'm missing maybe one or two possibilities there. But uh, double digits is definitely not off the table for Dune Part 2. Um, yeah, so I would look at this one as uh, uh, in sixth place. In seventh place, I'm going to go with actually uh, maybe not a consensus pick yet, but uh, one of the ones that's leading some of these races early, that's Sing Sing from uh, A24. Um, I think I'm just going to have to wait until I actually see the movie. Uh, It is based off a popular, I can't remember if it's actually a play or if it's a full-on musical. Um, But um, yeah, that being said, A24, again, nothing to sneeze at. They always uh, get a surprise or two as far as nominations and stuff. And they, uh, you know, they can pull uh, pull off uh, some big wins and stuff, uh, some surprise wins as well. So I wouldn't be shocked if we see this one kind of pull... Because I think where some people have said, well, what if it does pull like a, a coda effect where it's like, okay, it's kind of consistently nominated through the season. And then shortly after the nominations come out, that's when a lot of people catch up with it. And they're like, oh, this is actually really, really, really good. And then they uh, put it up to number one on everything and it wins PGA and stuff and kind of takes on that track. Um, I wouldn't be, I mean, it, it's it's definitely one of these smaller films outside of if you go with something like, a, uh, you know, a Nora or Amelia Perez or maybe... One of those other ones where it's like, okay, maybe that also has a similar, uh, you know, line of uh, uh, you can follow there to a Best Picture win. But um, for me, again, I'm just a little hesitant on this one. Um, It's not a film when it's been expanding here slowly into more theaters. It hasn't been, like, increasing in its box office totals, like, significantly. Um, I just don't know. I mean, the word of mouth right now really, again, largely is with its uh, Critical Darling groups. Uh, but, uh, outside of that, I'm just, again, I'm not hearing a ton, ton of buzz yet outside of just people that really, really like it, like a lot of the performances in it and stuff. But, uh, yeah. And one other key key factor, I think, uh, the director of the film is not necessarily a huge commodity, a well-known director. Um, and if you're going to win Best Picture, unless you're Green Book, um, 
you know, as of recently, again, I'm trying to think unless there was one I'm totally missing here in the last couple of years, uh, unless your green book recently, um, you don't win Best Picture without a director nomination, Argo being another one here in the last, uh, well, it's been more than 10 years actually for that one now, but uh, scary as that sounds. Um, anyway, so that's uh, seventh place for Sing, uh, Sing Sing right now. Uh, in eighth place, I have The Piano Lesson. This is Netflix's other major effort here. First trailer looked good and everything. Um, looks like it'll be an impactful story and everything. Um, I, again, I think with this one, we're going to see a majority of its nominations come above the line. Three acting races is definitely possible. Screenplay is very likely. But um, and then picture. But outside of that, again, it is you know it does have period to it, so it's a possibility in some of those uh, below the line categories. But I think like Fences, it's a film where those elements, they're there, but they're not really going to be front of mind. You know, something like Ma Rainey's, on the other hand, another August Wilson adaptation from Netflix. Uh, that one, some of the costume and the production design, that was a little more front of line, uh, front of mind, rather. A little more of the focus was on that and stuff. Uh, with Piano Lesson, I don't sense that that's going to be the case uh, this time. Um, so that won't necessarily help it in that cate- in those categories. But um, still, that being said, um, I think it's got uh, a lot of possibility to it. Um, I think, again, Amelia Perez is going to be the probably the first um, the first priority for Netflix this year, but I think their second one is definitely going to be The Piano Lesson. In ninth place, I have uh, The Seed of the Sacred Fig. Um, this is kind of an outside pick for me. Uh, once in a while, we do see those um, international directors get in. Uh, and sometimes if they get in, their film gets in, as in Triangle of Sadness or Drive My Car uh, in the last five years. Uh, I can see uh, definitely something like that happening for something like this uh, Seed of the Sacred Fig. Um, Again, a lot of critical praise to this one. Um, I don't know otherwise, like, outside of possibly a director nomination or a picture nomination, where else, like, a ton of its support's going to come from. Um... I don't know if it's going to necessarily have, like, the effect of something like um, Zone of Interest last year, which I think is another possible comp to it, because that one also got director and picture last year. Anatomy of a Fall also got director and picture last year. So with those, you had some, like, tech categories they got nominated in and stuff. See to the Sacred Fig, I can see, okay, maybe it would have to make that leap and make it into, like, an, a, a film editing category or a score or something like that. I think it would have to jump into one of those categories, I think, to really help it and, and seal the deal. And my 10th place pick right now um, is Night Bitch, which is uh, uh, Searchlight Pictures. Um, and Searchlight, um, I'm going to have to triple check here. Um, I'm trying to remember who has Conclave. Um is that Searchlight as well, or am I uh, not thinking about that correctly? No, th- that's Focus Features. Focus Features has a uh, uh, conclave. But um, uh, let me think here. Is uh, I'm trying to think who else uh, Searchlight has this year, because Searchlight's you know usually a pretty uh, reliable um, distributor when it comes to this stuff, and it's like usually they will um, have one or two contenders in there. But looking through it, it's like, I really don't know who, you know, what else Searchlight has on the docket here. So this could end up being their uh, their high-priority film and everything. Um, oh, wait, wait, wait. Unless it's, uh, no, I don't think it's that one. Uh, one we haven't mentioned yet that I have uh, outside of um, Best Picture. But, uh, nope, that's going to be an Amazon one. So, anyways. Um yeah, so that's one of the reasons. Also, I, I think this one, it, it's slotted to get at least one acting nomination and a screenplay nomination. Um, you know, we've seen films have that combo before and get nominated for Best Picture and everything. I don't know if it's going to do super well in the tech categories, but um, potentially a possible win in Best Actress for Amy Adams could really, uh, uh, especially if she's an expectant winner by the time nominations start rolling out, like if she starts winning a couple of these precursors and stuff, uh, televised awards and everything, then, okay, maybe, you know, that will uh, put the movie more on Oscar Watcher's radar, and it will uh, get in. Also, you know, PGA nomination would be big for it, especially if it becomes pretty competitive. Um, what else? Um, DGA, possibly? Possibly? I don't know. Uh, maybe not, but uh, <laughs> Marielle Heller, also in the directing category, I think it's uh, it's possible she gets in, but I'm not looking at her as like a uh, super high possibility at this point, but we'll, uh, we'll have to see. 
Okay, so some other competitors I do not have in for Best Picture right now, but I think do have a shot. Nickel Boys is probably one of the first ones I would go to. Uh, it's based on a Pulitzer Prize winning novel and everything. Um, again, has a lot of potential in some of the acting categories, screenplay, um, maybe one or two tech categories, because that one, again, is a period piece. So I would look at that one as uh, one to keep an eye on. Gladiator 2, I think, could do really well in some of those tech categories and then make its way to Best Picture as well. Um, a Complete Unknown, the Bob Dylan biopic, uh, definitely could smash in and, and get a good number of nominations. Uh, the Room Next Door is definitely one I would keep an eye out on. Uh, Hard Truths from Mike Lee, uh, A Real Pain, Jesse Eisenberg's film. Uh, if they want to go highbrow, they could go, and Blockbuster Wicked is out there, uh, Inside Out 2 is out there, Here is coming, <laughs> the movie Here. And then uh, Saturday Night as well is one um, that could make it in. Uh, juror number two, um, I'm trying to think, is there anything else? Fire Inside, we talked a little bit about last time as well. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that covers a lot of them in uh, Best Picture right now. So for Best Director, my lineup here of the five directors is Steve McQueen for Blitz in first, then Sean Baker for Nora in second, Denis Villeneuve, I have find, uh, getting in this year for Dune Part 2. Uh, hopefully he doesn't get looked over again like he did a couple years ago for, for the first Dune. That was a little silly to me. Even if, again, that wasn't maybe my necessarily my favorite film in the Oscar lineup that year, just the fact that he wasn't nominated, even though all the tech categories were and the screenplay was, that was ridiculous to me. Uh, Edward Berger for Conclave uh, is my fourth place pick, and Jacques Oder for Emilia Perez is my fifth. Um, so, of course, we've seen the last few years, it's been, you know, a little bit more diverse as far as the uh, nominations go for, uh, you know, men versus women in this category. And as far as women directors this year, I mean, um, you do have, again, we mentioned Mariel Heller, but other than that, you've got, um, you know, you've got really, the rest of them are really going to be outside contenders here at this uh, at this stage. Um, again, unless we see something that really shocks us here in the next uh, few weeks at uh, TIFF or Telluride or Venice. Um, I would say after her, probably the next one I would go with, uh, and again, she'd be a little bit of a long shot because it's her debut and stuff. But what about Rachel Morrison for Fire Inside? I mean, not, again, that's going to be a problem this year, I think, for getting a uh, you know one or possibly even two female directors in. There's just a lot of the high-profile films at this rate that are uh, in the Oscar mix for getting uh, nominated. They're just not really, you know, uh, d being directed by females. It's, it's a lot of male directors this year for a lot of those films. Um, anyways, so with that being said, uh, those are my five. Uh, the next couple I would look at, definitely Pedro Maldivar is one that I'm, he's going to be right on the outside, I think, uh, for uh, The Room Next Door. And that could potentially, you know, that's where I could flip and put that one in for Best Picture instead of something, uh, say something like Seed of the Sacred Fig or possibly Night Bitch or uh, maybe one of the others there. Uh, Greg Quader, uh, I, or Quadar, I'm not sure how, he, one of the two pronunciations, is the director for Sing Sing. Um that is, uh, again, that's part of the reason why I'm a little iffy on Sing Sing as well. He's, again, not a really known commodity yet. The director's branch can be really insular. You know, they if you're not Jordan Peele or Greta Gerwig that year, uh, a lot of those, you know, newer directors coming in, they just won't always nominate you. Um, uh, and I, you know, just to highlight that, we can look at the... Um, uh, let's see, I was going to pull up our list of nominees here in the last uh, few years, uh, just to kind of try to highlight that. And maybe, and you know, to be truth, you know, maybe we can look at maybe one or two other directors that were new and on the rise that did get in. Um, you know, Justine Trier, you know, had the international factor last year, as did Jonathan Glazer uh, and everything. The other three, I think, had been all, all been nominated before. Um but yeah, looking at 2022, it's like, okay, you had the the Daniels getting in. Okay, that's one example. Uh, though, again, one caveat to that is Everything Everywhere All at Once was a very overwhelming favorite by the time we got closer to nominations. If Sing Sing can get in that position, okay, then maybe it's a little more possible. But that's when I, you know, that's maybe one there. Um, 2021, pretty much all the nominees were, you know, people that had been around a while, even Hamaguchi uh, from uh, Japan had, um, you know, he'd had a few titles under his belt and stuff that, you know, some Western audiences and stuff and some Oscar voters probably had seen before. Uh, Emerald Fennel is probably one of the last ones for Promising Young Woman that was like a, 
you know, somebody that, again, was kind of more or less out of nowhere. Um, 2019, all those five were ones that people recognized and had done work before. Um, yeah, it's same with 2018, if you don't count, like, Paul Paolo, Paolo, uh, Palakowski, who uh, directed uh, Cold War. Um, but yeah, then Greta Gerwig and Jordan Peele, both kind of newcomers to, to directing and everything in 2017. That's kind of the last time we saw two uh, kind of newer directors get in. Um, before that, maybe Lenny Abrahamson for Room, you could argue. But uh, again, this uh, this branch in particular does like their auteurs. They like their um, international directors as well, which again cuts against somebody like Greg. To the best of my knowledge, I believe he's uh, American-born, but... Uh, Eh, maybe I should uh, triple check that before I uh, before I commit that. But um, let's see. I don't know if I can even. Um, no, not there. They don't have the information there. Um, uh, da, 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 writer director. Here we go. Uh, also, this is his uh, debut as well as a as a director. Um, again, I'm not really seeing. Boy, I'm not seeing anything. Oh, born in Austin, Texas. There you go. There you go. I couldn't find it for a minute there, but yeah. Um, anyhow, so again, this is not to say that like he can't be nominated. It's impossible. I'm going to put him out on the list. No, no, no. Of course not. But just just something I uh, I think we need to look at as well. Um, otherwise, Muhammad Razulov for uh, Seat of the Sacred Fig is definitely way up there for me as, as a possible uh, slot stealer there. Ridley Scott for Gladiator 2. Can't put him uh, totally in a box there. Todd Phillips for Joker, uh, very possible. Uh, Ramel Ross, if Nickel Boys really comes through, then, you know, he could st steal a slot, even though he's also, a, again, not a super known uh, commodity at this point. If a complete unknown does really well, James Mangold could break into Best Director for the first time. I mean, again, he's been around a while. Ford v. Ferrari was a Best Picture nominee. Walk the Line did very well at the Oscars uh, back in 2005. A um, couple acting nominations and an acting win and everything. So he's, again, one that, that's been around a little bit that I think uh, the director's branch is aware of uh, who he is, for example. And then, yeah, we mentioned, yeah, Mario Heller. It's like, outside of that, I really don't see a ton of uh, female directors at this shot having, like, any big, you know, possible uh, nominees there. Okay, in the best actor race, my five here are uh, Rafe Fines and first for Conclave. He's one of those guys, he's been around a while, he hasn't been nominated in a little bit, but uh, you could argue back even to uh, Schindler's List, so some people argued that year he, he probably could have uh, taken a, a prize home for his uh, performance there. It was excellent. And uh, being the center stage of Conclave and everything, it's a film that's going to be widely seen and everything. He's my early front runner here in this category. In second, I think he was overlooked for Black Klansman, and I hope he's not overlooked again if he gives as good a performance as he did there. It's John David Washington for The Piano Lesson, uh, being an August Wilson thing, uh, play and everything, adaptation. I see, again, uh, uh, you know, an easier path to some of these actors getting nominated for that. Uh, Timothee Chalamet is my third place pick here for a complete unknown, you know, biopic and everything. And uh, yeah, again, I, I feel like he's one, he's kind of overdue for a second nomination. Uh, Sebastian Stan is my fourth place pick for A Different Man. Uh, got really great rave reviews out of uh, Sundance. Um, even if the film doesn't look like it's going to be a huge player for other categories, again, makeup is a possibility. Maybe one or two other tech categories if it can fill in any of those slots. Uh, that would definitely help it. And then in fifth place, um, I'm going to go Joaquin Phoenix for Joker, uh, getting another nomination here. I don't see him winning again for the same role. Um, and I'm sure he's going to be great in the film and everything and, uh, and all that, but, uh, yeah. Now you'll notice I, the, one of the front runners right now, at least on gold derby from what I'm seeing is Coleman Domingo for Sing Sing. This is again, another spot where I'm just a little nervous. Now with Coleman, I, with this one though, even if Sing Sing doesn't end up winning, uh, or being our kind of front runner by that stage of nominations, Coleman getting nominated last year is a big, big plus for this movie and, and the, uh, and the performance and everything. Because if you're a past nominee, it increases your chance of getting nominated if there's an open slot, I think. Uh, we've seen it all, time and time again. Whenever there is an open slot in an acting uh, acting category, if there's someone in there that's been nominated or even won before, it really does benefit. Because that's, a you know, again, that's somebody the acting branch is familiar with. They tend to be people that have worked with everyone at that rate. So Coleman definitely uh, fits one of those, uh, like a puzzle piece as far as um, possibilities there. Otherwise, in this category, um, Ethan Harris uh, for Nickel Boys is one to keep an eye on. Um, 
I would say uh, Paul Mescal for Gladiator 2 if that one does take off. I'm a little shaky on it right now. I kind of went into it last time about him. Um, otherwise, um, I don't know. It, it kind of feels pretty wide open. If here does really well, Tom Hanks could get nominated again. But again, it's been pulling teeth for him to get another nomination after Castaway. It took him 19 years before he was nominated again, acting-wise at least, for um, uh, for uh, Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood. Um, already, again, one performance I've seen this year that I thought was really excellent was Jesse Plemons in Kinds of Kindness. Uh, I don't know if that one's going to go the distance and stick around as a big contender, but hey, it could happen. It could happen. Otherwise, um, yeah, at this rate, it kind of feels, some of these do feel like longer shots at this rate, but uh, we'll, we'll stop there for now. In Best Actress, I have... Mickey Madison out front for Honora. I initially had Amy Adams because I'm like, okay, Amy Adams, if she's been nominated six times before, six times the bridesmaid, never the bride, this could be the one. Teaming up with somebody who has uh, gotten uh, quite a few actors nominated here in the recent years. Um, and again, if Searchlight, this is their big contender this year, that's you know that's a place they can pump a lot of money in and, and give her a, a good chance of getting nominated and everything. That being said, I think with Mickey, she'll win a ton of those critics' prizes, I believe. And from there, especially if it's a film that does play very well internationally, she could really, uh, I think, uh, do really well here. Um, her film already has gotten you know, quite a few notices from its uh, Cannes performance, of course, with the Palme d'Or. Um, and I think with that, too, it's also going to play at a lot of these fall uh, film festivals. New we kind of went through it again uh, the other day there with like New York and uh, TIFF and everything. Telluride, I wouldn't be shocked at all if it showed up at Telluride. So I think with that one, I, I think it's going to have a lot of uh, a lot of things going its way. And from what I've sensed from the trailer and stuff and from some of the reviews, she kind of is the movie, too. Um, the movie kind of rides on her, her shoulders because if she's, you know, if her, she doesn't pull off this role... The whole movie sinks, and those kind of roles, I think, sometimes really can um, benefit you uh, as an Oscar contender. So I think with Mickey, I think she's got a good shot here, um, and especially if Honora too ends up winning like a screenplay or something, then it's got a little connective tissue. It's like okay, if it can win screenplay, it can win possibly even a film editing, it can win an acting prize, then it can make its way to Best Picture. So yeah, that's uh, my thinking there. Uh, so I've heard first. In second place, I will put Amy Adams for Night Bitch. I have her getting nominated again, but again, we'll see if that narrative takes off. In third place, I do have Saoirse Ronan, but caveat, little asterisk, I do not have her in for Blitz. I have her in for The Outrun, which is a little, uh, you know, smaller movie she did uh, earlier this year. Again, premiered at Sundance. A lot of people really liked her performance in that. And uh, she could easily get nominated for Blitz instead, but... Either way, she stands a pretty good shot at landing a nomination for one film or the other. She can't be nominated for both. There's an uh, Academy rule about that. But um, the outrun, it, it kind of feels, it's kind of similar to me. Um, uh, it kind of rings a bell with something like uh, Tommy Lee Jones. Because uh, the year of um, No Country for Old Men, which some had argued he was kind of a supporting actor in. Um, he doesn't get nominated for that. He gets nominated for the smaller film in the Valley of a uh, Ayla or Ela, whatever the however the hell he pronounced it. I never saw it, but um, you know the smaller film, the one that was more acting heavy and stuff. Not to say that Blitz is not going to be an acting heavy film, but I think with the Outrun again, this is another movie where it's it's on her shoulders. Where if she doesn't do her job as an actress, the movie's going to fall apart. And you know the reviews were really good on the Outrun. Uh, comes out, uh, I believe, in October. Again, that was one that wasn't, uh, for whatever reason, on my other list. But um, again, I, I want to say that's an October, uh, maybe early November release. And I think it's uh, Sony Pictures Classics, who, again, usually puts together decent campaigns for their acting contenders and stuff. Um, but either way, she's a four-time nominee. Whether she gets nominated for that or Blitz, I think she stands a good shot at getting a nomination regardless. In fourth place, I'll put in Lady Gaga for Joker. Um she, you know, her not getting in for um, House of Gucci, even though she was the only contender for Best Actress that year to get Critics' Choice, BAFTA, Globe, and SAG nominations, that was that was something that I think it was just more of an anti, I don't think it was an anti-Lady Gaga thing, it was more an anti just, we just didn't care for House of Gucci kind of thing uh, at the Oscars. That's my feeling at least. So with this, Joker's going to be, uh, I, I would hope, a more liked film. 
Uh, the tech categories are definitely going to be, I think, a little kinder to this one. House of Gucci, you know, it had a, a really good shot at landing, like, costume design and makeup and everything. I think it ended up only getting uh, makeup nomination and everything. Was it only makeup or was it only costumes? I forgot. But, uh, yeah, it only landed one nomination. Um, I think with her, again, it's going to be that. And I think, uh, seems like she's uh, doing really well in the trailers and stuff. And, uh yeah, again, she's an actress that I think whenever I see her pop up in something new, I feel like her her acting uh, chops have been getting increasingly better. And I think with something like this, uh, it could uh, uh, kind of come together here for uh, uh, her second nomination, uh, acting-wise, I should say. And then I, uh, in fifth place, I have uh, Marion Jean-Baptiste for Hard Truths. It might be a little sympathy at this rate, because I think it'd be really neat to see her get nominated again. Uh, almost 30 years after Secrets and Lies. Again, an actress who's been around, done some stuff, but just has not been in a huge profile uh, film that has gotten some Oscar consideration. So I just that's my uh, personal vote there. That being said, it's hard to leave a couple of these contenders off the list, like uh, Carlos Sofia Gascon for uh, Amelia Perez. That feels like, again, a lot of the ensemble's going to get in. I it, That one's a struggle for me. I just don't know who to drop uh, to put her in, but I feel like she's definitely got a great, great, great shot at getting nominated. Uh, look at past winner and a past nominee in other years, Julianne Moore for The Room Next Door. Uh, looks like she is, uh, campaigning in lead. Um, I better look down the list here. Do we have, uh, Tilda? Is she going more in the supporting role, or is she gonna be co-lead? I, I guess at this rate we haven't heard for sure. I wouldn't be shocked if, if they put uh, Tilda in supporting and they uh, keep Julianne in lead, but uh, that's definitely one to look at. Um, one that could actually surprise us and win a couple critics' prizes if it's not going to be Mickey. Uh, June Squibb actually got a lot of notices. She's a past nominee for Nebraska. She has the movie Thelma out, which I think has to do with something with her going to, back to college or something, or community college or something. I don't know. But... Uh, that's one I, I've heard a couple people say that that could surprise. And again, being a past nominee can help you. Um, Cynthia Revo for Wicked is one I've heard some people talk about. I'm just not sure that that's going to happen. And um, let's see, I'm kind of looking down the list here. Anyone else that we're uh, kind of forgetting about this, right? Um, possibly Emma Stone for Kinds of Kindness, if that one sticks around. Uh, Robin Wright for here. I'll, I'll drop in there just in case. Um and then Demi, uh, Demi Moore for uh, The Substance uh, is one I've heard a couple people talk about, but uh, I think that one will have to buoy a little bit more of just... A, 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 uh, it'll have to get something other than Best Actress, I think, uh, to do that. Otherwise, that feels like Hustlers all over to me. It just feels like something that it's like, okay, they're putting all their chips in on, on one category, and again, when that happens, it's usually an acting category. That's where they can sometimes just totally drop you off and, and you don't make it, so... Let's go to the supporting actor race. Uh, this one, I, I feel like we have quite a few contenders in this category as well. I'm going to start with Sam Jackson uh, for the piano lesson. It, we could see a narrative here where it's like, okay, let's it's a lifetime achievement type thing. He's only been nominated the one time before, and that was 30 years ago this year for Pulp Fiction. Isn't it about damn time we give Sam L. Jackson a motherfucking Oscar? I can already see the ads. <laughs> I can already see the ads, at least online ads. I don't know if they put them in print everywhere. Uh, saying almost verbatim something like that. I, I mean, I can just see it right now. Uh, but uh, that being said, let's wait until the movie comes out and everything. It's uh, Again, it, it'll screen here uh, in a, a few weeks uh, from the time of this recording, at least. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to put him out front just for now. Uh, Clarence Macklin has gotten uh, quite a few praises for uh, his performance in Sing Sing. I've actually got him in second place. Uh, Kieran Culkin in third for Real Pain. Uh, Harris uh, Dickinson for Blitz in fourth. Stanley Tucci's my fifth place pick for Conclave. Um, it's really between him and John Lithgow, I think, for that fifth slot. And I think uh, Tucci's only gotten the one nomination for Lovely Bones. He's been around. He works with everybody, does some television, does uh, movies and stuff. I, I feel like working with everyone and, again, being in a film that a lot of people are going to see, Tucci feels like the better option to me as far as, like, more, li uh, more likely at this rate. Um, but definitely Lithgow. Could get a nomination for that. Um, uh, advanced notices say both he and, and Tucci are both kind of, uh, they have scenes, you know, that will uh, propel them to uh, possible nominations. You know, maybe a monologue or two or something. You know, I, I haven't heard much, you know, from this stage. But uh, Denzel for Gladiator 2, maybe. Maybe he's got a few kind of standout scenes in the trailer and stuff. Uh, the one I would circle, though, really look at the, uh, this one 
Edward Norton for a complete unknown. I I remember early on in the the Birdman year, a lot of us said, oh, you know, Michael Keaton, you know, he'll be uh, one to look at. Then the movie started screening. Everybody's like, oh, wait, Ed Norton's also really, really good in this. And Emma Stone's really good. And the whole ensemble. But uh, Edward Norton, I remember, kind of really started skyrocketing up the charts there uh, that year. And Mark Ruffalo last year, I think, for uh, Poor Things was another one. It's like, oh, yeah, Mark Ruffalo's in it. And then this, the movie started screening. Everybody's like, whoa, Mark Ruffalo's awesome in this. Uh, I can see Edward Norton also getting that. It'll be a little later this year, though, because, of course, uh, his is not going to be a film that's going to be riding the fall circuit. Uh, this one will be a Christmas release. I would actually not be shocked if it's one we don't see the first screenings until sometime in December. Um, otherwise, we've got uh, Mark... Edelstein or Edelstein for uh, Anora. I'm sure I'll get the pronunciation right on that somewhere down the line. Um, who's basically, I, I believe, the basically the male lead of the film, pretty much. Just uh, probably again a very safer bet to put him in supporting. Um, that could happen again, especially if Anora ends up overperforming Oscars morning. Uh, having not seen it, uh, Pedro Pedro Pascal. I uh, he's again he's been in everything as far as television, film, and everything. I wouldn't be shocked at all if uh, if he um, uh, gets a nomination there. So there you go. All right. And uh, other than that, um, I don't know. I, I feel like that's probably it for now. I mean, again, there's a few other long shots we can look at. But, uh, yeah, I think that's probably it for now. In Supporting Actress, my five here, uh, Daniel Deadweiler for Piano Lesson is my uh, early front runner here. She was overlooked, I think, for uh, uh, the movie she did here. Uh, was it two, two years ago? And um, sorry, guys, it's kind of late. Uh, my uh, mind's slipping from me now. What was the? Uh, it was a one-word title. I remember that, and it was one. Uh, it was expected to get maybe one, maybe two nominations. Till that's right, Till. Because um, I remember it was a short title, but yeah. Because uh, that one, I, I think some people looked at it maybe getting, you know, a song nomination and everything. Ended up getting blanked at the Oscars. Um, so um, I think with this one, though, uh, again, it, it seems like a role that will uh, work toward um, Academy Appreciation and everything. Aj Nuelas Taylor for Nickel Boys is in second place for me. Zoe Saldana in third for Amelia Perez. I have Tony Collette in fourth place for Juror Number 2. And in fifth place... I've got Selena Gomez for uh, Amelia Perez. I think um, we saw a break last year, finally, for the first time in a, in many, many years, where we did not see, in one of the supporting categories, two actors or actresses from the same film get nominated. Um, I think this year, Amelia Perez, that has the best shot at landing these, you know, landing a double nomination in this particular category. Conclave has a little bit of a shot of doing it in supporting actor. Uh, could be possible. Uh, maybe someone, if someone else from the ensemble of uh, Sing Sing uh, starts jumping on, like Paul Racy, who was a previous nominee. Um, okay, you know, maybe then I could I could get that argument as well. But uh, yeah. So uh, again, supporting actress though. Look at uh, Isabel Rossellini also being a, a real possibility here for Conclave. Uh, Tilda Swinton for the room next door if she does not end up being lead, and then Julianne gets supporting, or maybe they both go lead or both go supporting, depending on how uh, depending on how they want to do that. Um, let's see. Otherwise, um, I've heard a couple rumblings. Okay, if a complete unknown does really well, maybe Elle Fanning could get in, uh, for that. Um, let's see here. Anyone else that I can think of right now? Um, sorry, probably not Zendaya for Dune Part 2. I remember at one point for the first Dune, she was looked at as a possible contender, and I was like, I don't think so. And then the movie came out, and everybody's like, nope, she's in it for two seconds. <laughs> Um, let's see. Otherwise, um, yeah, I think that'll probably do it for supporting actress. Going to the screenplay prizes, starting with the original screenplay, uh, category. For now, I have Blitz winning, lining up with our, you know, picture winner and stuff for screenplay, which didn't end up happening last year, uh, and everything. Uh, Anora in second place. So I think Anora is really the one that could end up winning that prize. Uh, especially if Anora loses Best Actress and it loses Picture and they want to give it something, Screenplay could very, very easily um, be the place to award it. Emilia Perez in third, Hard Truths in fourth, and A Real Pain in fifth. Um, after that, again, you got uh, See the Sacred Fig, which could very easily slide into a spot here. If night, uh, Saturday night goes over really well, that could land a spot. Uh, the substance, if that takes off, this could be pl uh, a place that gets nominated. Um, 
Juror number two is an original screenplay from everything I've heard, so that could play here, A Different Man, potentially. And then uh, I could even see something like Challengers maybe surprising us and getting a screenplay nomination. On the adapted side, uh, it gets pretty packed here after a little while. Uh, for right now, I'm going to go Sing Sing in first place for uh, for a, a, a win here. Uh, just kind of riding the momentum of the early thing right now. I could easily, though, see Conclave overtaking it and taking uh, the uh, the actual win when we get to the Oscars. I have that in second. Piano Lesson in third, Night Bitch in fourth, and Dune Part Two in fifth. So I am leaving off Nickel Boys, which, yeah, that feels like, based off a of Pulitzer winning uh, book and everything, that could very easily get nominated. The Room Next Door, definitely look out for that one. Complete Unknown, that could get in. Um... Not impossible for something like Joker to get in. Inside Out 2, I think, stands a shot. Uh, the initial, uh, the first uh, Inside Out got in for original screenplay. Uh, and also here is based on a book, I believe. So that one has a little bit of a shot. And then I think that's probably going to be about it for now. Um, yeah, so there you go. There's the top eight categories. Um, yeah, so I guess, uh, just really quick about, uh, the rest of the channel here and what's going to come up. Like I said, I do have a trip coming up here a few, uh, couple weeks almost to the day, uh, from the, uh, recording of this video. Uh, these should all be posted, by the way, uh, not long after Labor Day or around Labor Day. Um, so yeah, we'll probably, I'll, I'll, uh, have to go dark there for a while as I get ready for that big trip and everything, and, uh, time will probably be a little short anyhow, so... Probably won't be able to recap like Venice or uh, Telluride or anything before we uh, before we get that going. TIFF will start pretty much uh, not long after I'll leave for my trip and everything, so I won't be able to uh, cover that in depth until uh, I get back. And by that time, the festival will be just about wrapping up, I believe. Uh, let me check again the dates on, on that. Um, let's see. Does this have the dates on it? I'm going to try to find it here. Uh, hang on. Here we go. Let's find this. Uh, oh, actually, no, never mind. Um, it ends on the 15th of September. Okay, so yeah, that's actually right after I leave. So um, yeah, so I, TIFF will be done by the time I get back. Okay, sorry, I had my schedule a little off there. Um, a TIFF will actually start while I'm uh, while I'm still here in the States, but uh, yeah. Uh, like I said, I do have a wedding to go to on uh, the weekend of the 6th as well, so... Um, yeah, so I'll be gone for that. <laughs> um, otherwise, I've been incessantly teasing um, a video series that I want to add to the channel uh, that's going to be a different different for the channel as far as its presentation and everything. It's not too far off from the channel content, though. If you're a big fan of uh, Academy Awards, Academy Awards history, and Academy Awards theory and that kind of stuff, these videos, I think, will be your... Uh, There'll be something you'll want to check out. I'll just I'll just say that. Um, since last time, I do have some progress updates here on this. Two. That's right. Two of the five videos are done. They're locked in. Everything's good on them. The sound is good on them. I'm not putting music behind these. I think that, that might be just a step too far. I just, you know, at this early stage, and music also will get flagged a little easier on YouTube for that kind of stuff. I have some other stuff in the videos that could possibly get flagged as well, but I, I did a, a check on one of them, and it came through good, so uh, that's good. Anyhow, two of them are done. The third one I'm currently working on when I can, and uh, it's not halfway done, but it's uh, getting close to halfway done. Uh, then I, yeah, I have two videos to do after that. So, again, the plan for that is because it's uh, a deal where it's like, okay, if I have nothing else going on, if I have a lot of stuff cleared out of my schedule, if I work on it, you know, maybe not every day, but, you know, every couple days or something, the second video only took me a month to complete. So um, I had a, behind the scenes, I had a lot of trouble with my uh, computer here as far as storage space because when I was working on it, I needed to get clips, Film clips, that's right. There's actually going to be film clips in these. So um, I had to get those. When I would download them and save them on the computer, at least temporarily, to you know put them into the video and everything, at, initially it was taking up so much space on the computer, and I couldn't figure out what was the, what was the issue because I'm like, okay, I could only pull like two, three, maybe four clips, and all of a sudden I would get a warning that says, you're out of storage. I'm like, okay, what the hell? So um, I figured out almost by the time the first video I was done editing it, I finally looked at, okay, well, what's the issue? And I kind of dug in and I'm like, oh, okay. So one of these files on Mac here or something 
actually has like this this much space left because it's stuff like from actually from uh, the same uh, app I use to record these videos. If for whatever reason they get misplaced as far as saving them or whatever, if they get thrown into that file, it's like a huge chunk of that or whatever. So I went through, deleted a bunch of those, and it's like all of a sudden it's like, nope, I can get as much as many clips as I want, pretty much, and uh, twenty, maybe twenty, twenty-five, thirty clips at a time, and boom, they can all be there. I can get them edited into the final video and everything and then remove them again and it's not a problem. So because of that, I was able to much, much quicker get through everything. And also, I, I think just also, it's uh, one of those things, it's uh, the editing software I'm using, I was getting much, uh, much more adept at uh, using it. Um, I got the flow of how the video was going to go, or videos, I should say, how they're going to go timing-wise and editing-wise and rhythm-wise. And I really started to get that down. And I, I feel like once I got into that groove, then boom, I could knock out, you know, two whole chunks of it in a, in a day and stuff. Anyhow. So, um, yeah, so I've got two videos done. The third one, uh, maybe about somewhere around 35 to 40 percent of the way done, roughly. Uh, two videos after that that I still have to record the audio for and everything. So that's going to be down the road. Now, again, because of time consumption and everything, I might get... I might get three, four hours a week. Maybe I can work on it. So when you cut that down, it's like, okay, that's maybe I can get maybe 10% of it done in that time of the particular video I'm working on or whatever. So, um, yeah. So uh, again, the initial plan was I was going to wait until I got three done and then release the first one. The problem is, but if I were to do that and I would say, okay, let's put the video one out on this day, I might wait, you know, let's say two, three weeks, then release the second one and then wait another two, three weeks, release the third one. By the time we get to another two to three weeks for the fourth video, maybe by that time the fourth video is only 30% of the way done. So I can't, you know, uh, hold up on that schedule. So I'd love to do this in a way where I can release them on a schedule basis, you know, get the first one, you know, get them all released in something of a order that makes sense, you know, something that's a little more reliable. It's like, okay, once every couple weeks or once every three weeks or something like that. Um... And, you know, and make it something, you know, that you guys actually might look forward to. And you might actually like, oh, okay, it's going to come out this day. So I can start searching for it at some point that day or something, you know. So that's the, uh, that's going to be the, the big plan there. So it's a massive uh, job and everything. It, t together, all the five videos are going to have somewhere around seven, uh, maybe I don't want to maybe over exaggerate here. Somewhere between six and 700 clips from different films. I want to say that. So that's a lot. <laughs> Almost pretty much every video is going to have somewhere between 100 and 150 clips uh, put together from different movies. Uh, there might be multiple clips from the same movie in there, but regardless, it's uh, it's something like that mixed together. And all the videos, by the way, uh, the first two, uh, the first one, if I'm if I'm remembering correctly here, the first one was 24 minutes, the second one was 23 minutes. So they're not super long uh, altogether. Probably they would be under two hours if you watched them back to back to back to back to back. Um, but it's it's going to be, I, I think it's going to be great. I've already shown the first couple videos to some people and everybody has has uh, really been positive with their feedback. They're like, oh, that looks great. Or wow, it's like I didn't know that. Or, you know, it's really, it's a really, really fun uh, experimental kind of uh, take on some uh, some Academy history and stuff. So uh, that I want to tease and it's like, yeah, we'll probably, uh, if everything goes perfectly, if I have a lot of stuff cleared out and I can, uh, really spend some time on it, maybe by January, February, I might have all of them done and then be ready to release them, you know, pretty much as the Oscar season is wrapping up, kind of start with maybe the first one or two might be out by then. That's if everything goes perfectly to schedule. If it does not, we're probably more likely looking at this, um, Somewhere next summer, uh, we'll start releasing them, probably like May, June of, of next year, somewhere in there. Uh, but again, a lot of that's just going to come down to timing and everything. And also, speaking of timing, it'll also depend on my uh, the third book in my Winter Loan series, which is I've got the second draft done. It's the biggest book yet, uh, over 300 pages this time, uh, in the second draft at least. And this is something, man, I, I mean... Um, I feel like I'm tooting my own horn with so much of the talk here in the, the last part of this video, but uh, just compared, I think, to the first couple books I put out, this third book is, um, 
it's it's getting i think more to the meat at some of some of these characters i feel like i'm progressing a lot as a writer i think just between especially the first book to this third one it's it's night and day difference i feel um but yeah i've actually uh and i you know obviously nothing's official yet but i've uh I have talked with a uh, one member of a publishing company, actually, uh, potentially into uh, looking into someone else publishing it, not just through Amazon this time. That was, you know, that's a while ago now, because uh, I kind of said, well, I'm kind of working on the first draft of this third book, you know, and everything. And he's like, uh, the guy said, you know, oh, yeah, maybe we can look at it once you get a little further. So obviously, anybody can say that anywhere. So it's, you know, it's not a huge, uh, you know, nothing confirmed or anything yet, but uh I think this one, I'm almost to the level where I think I am ready to kind of uh, start prodding around a little bit without, you know, getting into, you know, into too many hucksters out there that could just try to say, oh, yeah, I'll publish your book. Just give me 25,000, you know, <laughs> don't do that. You know, uh, you know, I'll, I'll avoid that. But uh, yeah, it's it's to the level where I'm like, I feel like if I actually did take this to maybe a couple publishing companies, maybe one or two of them out there out of, you know, however many there are. Maybe a couple of them actually would take a shot at it. I don't know. Uh, maybe they'd come back and say, "Nope, this is a piece of shit." But I don't know. <laughs> Just for myself, I feel like again, it's it's the 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 writing is progressing, and I think the characters are starting to come out more so and more so. And uh, yeah, so if you're uh, one of the people out there who have been who have been reading and following the series and everything, I do have the third book. Uh, S the roughly planned for release next fall. Uh, it'll be almost actually a year from. Uh, Usually I release them like the end of September, so it'll probably be the uh, end of September 2025 uh, for that one. But uh, again, we a little bit of time to go on that one. I do want to start on the third draft and kind of uh, go from there and maybe make a couple more changes on it. And then, yeah, then I'll follow up and see what I can do there. But uh, but yeah, I've got that working on. Otherwise, I don't think I have way too much else. I did, like you know, I'm working on some screenplay stuff, uh, one of which is... Uh, I'm uh, just on the initial draft here, but uh, it, it'd be a horror picture, a horror picture, you know, something scary, but uh, uh, I don't know. It, it's an idea that I'm kind of banding about and kind of trying out and stuff, and it's uh, a period piece set in the 20s and stuff, but uh, we, I don't know, we might eventually talk about that one one day, but uh, that's one I've been, you know, when I got, you know, the initial, you know, inkling to write it actually was from a dream I had uh, uh, almost a year ago now, probably. But uh, and it was like an image from that dream just uh, just stuck with me. It was it was a scary scary image, and I'm like, okay, somehow I have to replicate this <laughs> in in some form or another. And when I got to, I finally got to the scene in the script where that would actually come into play, where it would actually fall into line and stuff. And it's like, oh, it just felt so. I mean, not therapeutic, but it was very uh, <laughs> uh, very good feeling to actually write that out and be like, ooh, this is what it would look like uh, and everything. So anyhow. So yeah, I'm still working on some stuff. I'm not just sitting here trying to look up Oscar stuff and then listening to experts and, you know, going one way on some stuff and going another way on the other. Uh, I've got other stuff planned and, and other stuff I'm working on. So um, yeah. Okay, so we are uh, with the uh, conclusion of this video. We have now begun the 2025 Oscar season. It's very early, of course. Uh, a lot of stuff is going to change. A lot of stuff can change. So we're going to we're going to take it easy. Uh, here through the first few weeks, uh, you know, for myself, I'll be busy with other stuff. So again, probably won't see much from me here in the next uh, the next little bit. If we need to have an emergency episode for something, if something drastic drastic happens, then okay, we'll uh, we'll try to do that. But again, I'm going to be really really short on time on a lot of this stuff, so I uh, apologize for that. But uh, probably we'll see you at the end of this month after I am back from my uh, European vacation. Hopefully it's a better one than Clark Roswald had with his family, but, uh, yep, come what may. <laughs> so we'll see you at the end of the month, and we'll recap all the fall film festivals, uh, talk about any releases that are out that I've managed to see, and, uh, yeah, we'll go from there. <laughs>